This is food. Now you probably didn't need me to tell you that this is food. You know what food looks like, you know what food smells like, you know how food feels and what it tastes like. You've been dealing with food your whole life, which is a good thing because food keeps you alive. However, even good things must be had in moderation, and you've probably experienced times where you've eaten too much food, and unless you're a contestant in a food eating contest where people push past that discomfort in order to eat the most food humanly possible, you're usually motivated to stop eating. Three, two, Regardless of what you want to do, your body likes to maintain a balance of how much you eat, and it will tell you through either hunger or satisfaction whether you've had enough. But how does it do this? Well, when we're talking about hunger, we're talking about the communication between two different systems. The digestive system and the brain. While it may be interesting to ask whether we are our brains, or if we're just a part of our brain that other parts talk to, it's beyond the scope of this video to delve into the philosophical debates and neural anatomy involved in answering that question. So I'm going to kind of cheat and say that we become hungry because our brain tells us we're hungry. And the part of our brain that tells us we're hungry is the hypothalamus. Like nearly everything in your body, the hypothalamus doesn't only have one function. It regulates a lot of other things that fly under the radar. Now, it may seem trivial to say that the hypothalamus just tells us that we're hungry, and that's because it is, but that's the depth we're going to examine as far as the brain goes. The hypothalamus is the top of our hierarchy. It's our endpoint. We eat something, stuff happens, and then our hypothalamus gives us input on whether we should eat more or stop. So let's fill in the gaps here. This is the major question we're going to try to answer. What signals your hypothalamus to tell you you're hungry? Well, if we go one level down from the hypothalamus, the answer is hormones. Hormones are responsible for long-range signaling in the body, and hunger is no exception. Hormones are molecules, not simple molecules like water, larger and more complicated molecules like insulin, which you've probably heard of before. Hormones are born in certain tissues, travel in the blood through the circulatory system until they reach certain parts of the body, and bind to receptors on cells, which causes some kind of effect. There's a huge array of hormones produced in different tissues, and although there are many hormones involved in regulating hunger, I'm only going to be talking about two of them, ghrelin and leptin. Both of these hormones act on the hypothalamus in order to create some kind of effect. In ghrelin's case, this effect is hunger, and in leptin's case, this effect is satisfaction. This brings us to another question. How and when are these hormones produced? So let's talk about leptin first. Let's say you eat something. Leptin is produced in your adipose tissue or fat tissue. From there, it's secreted into the blood and carried through your circulatory system to your brain, where it passes the blood-brain barrier and enters the hypothalamus. There, it interacts with leptin-specific receptors on neurons in your hypothalamus to inhibit appetite. Although that made it sound like leptin is only present after you've had a meal, that's only partially true. Leptin is always present in your blood in amounts which are proportional to how much body fat you have, and it enters the brain in amounts according to its concentration in your blood plasma. This means it's serving as a constant signal to your brain about how much fat you have, or, in other words, how much energy you have stored. In any system which serves a function, 
defects can cause unwanted outcomes. A defect in the leptin signaling system may result in obesity. Much like insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes, people can become resistant to the signaling effects of leptin. This makes eating food less satisfying than normal and causes people to eat more than is required to simply maintain a healthy body fat percentage. This system is also more sensitive to underfeeding than it is to overfeeding. That is, leptin increases less when you eat than it decreases when you don't eat. This is to say that your body doesn't care as much about you eating too much as it does about you eating too little. So what about ghrelin, the hunger-inducing hormone? Ghrelin is produced in the top part of the stomach called the fundus, and like leptin, is secreted into the blood and transported to the brain through the circulatory system. There, it acts on cells in the hypothalamus to promote hunger. As we would expect, ghrelin has a production pattern that's opposite of leptins. After we eat, ghrelin levels decrease, and after we haven't eaten for a while, ghrelin levels increase again. And here's a cool thing about ghrelin. It has been shown that just looking at pictures of food can increase the amount of ghrelin in your blood. Now, whether there's a difference between looking at food you think would be appetizing and looking at food you think would be unappetizing has yet to be shown. Listen to me, Hatcher. You gotta tell him silent breed is people! But I think it's safe to assume that looking at appetizing food works the best if you're trying to intentionally increase your ghrelin levels. Hold on a second, though. Why would we want to increase our ghrelin levels? One of the themes from this video has been that aspects of biological systems do not have singular functions. And in respect of that theme, ghrelin is no different. In addition to the hypothalamus, ghrelin has been found to act on the hippocampus as well. The hippocampus is the part of your brain that is responsible for memory. In the hippocampus, ghrelin causes the creation of new neurons, as well as long-term potentiation, which is the strengthening of connections between neurons. This means when ghrelin enters your brain, you not only become hungry, you become better at making new memories and learning. This is pretty cool, because now we can start talking about hunger as a learning tool, and we can start talking about pictures like this as a study aid. So the next time you're trying to learn something, it might not be a bad idea to flip through some pictures of food first.